Well, hey guys, thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry and this review of the Milwaukee inch and three quarter SDS Max rotary hammer. I'm in the middle of the demolition phase on a project here and tomorrow I'm going to be chiseling up the slate tile and the mortar bed that's underneath it off of a concrete floor. And this SDX Max rotary hammer is just a tool for the job. As you can see from this pile of rubble here, I'm in the thick of it making a mess, but sometimes you have to go backwards before you can go forwards. And because there's so much work involved, this is the sort of thing where I want to make it easy on myself because nobody else is going to do it for me. And I need to save plenty of energy for hauling this stuff out to the truck and off to the landfill. And minimizing unnecessary hard work from a job that's already hard enough is where this Milwaukee SDS Max inch and three quarter rotary hammer comes into play. <laughs> You can tell by the carrying case alone that this is not a toy, but an amazingly robust piece of equipment that's built to stand up to a task like this without even breaking a sweat. The carrying case is pretty functional and one nice feature about it is that it has storage for bits in this front compartment here. And this three inch bit here is my weapon of choice for chipping up the slate tile and whatever mortar is holding it to the concrete. Bits are installed in an SDS Max tool by just slipping the bit into the chuck and pulling back on a collar until the, dip, the bit drops into place. And this Milwaukee model has a feature that unlocks the chisel here. So you can, the chisel can be spun to the place, to the orientation that the tool is going to be used and then switched back to the hammering place because I'm using the chisel feature, not the hammer drill feature for this operation. And I want the bit to be oriented like this for chiseling along the floor. And then I can rotate this auxiliary handle into a position like this for using the tool. And this is the typical orientation for using a chisel bit in this tool. It's also pretty similar if you've got a drill bit in here and using it as a rotary hammer to drill a large hole in concrete. And I started using this tool in this orientation. I did a bunch of demo and chipping in another room. And here's a couple of still shots of that room where I had to chip up multiple layers of self-leveling floor material, old concrete, tile, etc. And the tool is more than up to the task with plenty of chipping power. And the model 5548-21 rotary chipping hammer really did help make that nasty demolition project doable. And when I worked through that heavy demolition phase, I started to notice that the ergonomic position of the handle and the chisel was really hard on my wrist. If I was 25 years younger, I probably would have just blown it off. But as it is, I put the, even if I put the auxiliary handle like this and chiseled like this, working like this for hours on end, it's really hard on my wrist. But there's a lot of the chipping to do and I couldn't just do it in phases. I had to just get after it and chisel up the whole works like I'm going to do to this tomorrow. So my initial review of the tool is it's got plenty of power, great features. This has an anti-vibration handle. They call it an AVS system, anti-vibration system where this whole handle is kind of flexible. It reduces uh, vibration to the wrist and I'm sure that using this for, for horizontal drilling, that sort of thing, that this is a better wrist position. But because of the nature of chipping up this tile on a floor, it's not off a wall, I'm not demolishing something at waist height, um, this just was an unsustainable ergonomic situation here. So I'm not going to show you what chipping it up in this fashion looks like right now because I have to tent this off to do the work. But I do want to show you the workaround I came up with because like I've been saying, this is a great tool for this job. And with assist from my degree at MIT, which is <laughs> mistakes I've tried, I came up with an auxiliary handle that takes this tool from good or great to excellent. And I'm going to take this back to the next level carpentry shop to show you what that looks like. Boom, here I am back at the next level carpentry shop. And the main feature of the ergonomic improvement that I've made to this tool for making it more user friendly is to switch the grip orientation from this way to this way. And ideally, if this handle had some sort of a, 
uh, latch on it and you could just change the setting and flip the handle so that it goes from a vertical handle to a horizontal one, that would be great, but I can imagine from an engineering standpoint that would be pretty difficult. And because that's not the primary use for this tool, it needs to be adaptable between chipping and drilling. Uh, that just doesn't make sense. But for the work that I need to do on the job site, a modification like this is pretty much essential. And the pieces parts you see here are the auxiliary handle that I made so that I can chip up that uh, slate tile in tight quarters without undue comfort in my wrist. And another thing uh, particular to this situation is uh, the job where I'm working is pretty tight quarters. I got to go around a lot of corners, a lot of angles. It's not necessarily a lot of square footage of tile that needs to be chipped up, but it's stuck down pretty well and there's tight quarters. And the reason I'm saying that is I know that there's carts made for electric chipping hammers. Those are, um, from what I can tell, are generally uh, dedicated electric jackhammers, electric chipping hammers. And there's a picture of one here and that's a bigger tool. I know Milwaukee makes bigger chipping hammers. They could go on a cart like that if you're you know, doing a whole house, a living room, a family room or whatever, rather than a hallway and a bathroom and a little laundry room. And one of the things that kept me from buying one of those carts or looking into that is that uh, they're set up at an angle and you can, you can move the angle up and down for chipping, but in my experience, there's an awful lot of places that need to be chipped straight down, come at from multiple angles where repositioning that cart in tight quarters just wouldn't make sense. So I don't want to make it sound like if you're in the tile removal business uh, that this is the way to go. But if you're in the custom remodeling business or just doing a couple of standalone projects where a tool uh, of this cost and this size makes more sense, then you might find the solution I came up with a workable thing and might be something you're interested in to give your wrist a break. So let me show you how this goes together. I'll pop the bit out of the tool to make it easier for handling while I'm explaining all this stuff. And as you're watching, keep in mind that everything you see here is a prototype. I came up with a simple sketch out of thin air and set about making a tool to fit the parameters that I was shooting for. And I feel fortunate in the fact that the prototype worked well enough that I didn't have to do a version 2.0 to make it functional. But if I was starting all over right now with knowledge I learned while making and using this prototype, I might make a couple minor changes to some of the pieces parts, but none of those minor adjustments are significant enough to make it worth starting over and building a second handle just for this video. As an overview, my goal was to change the handle position from this way to this way, either, you know, hand up or hand down, but not instead of cocking my wrist, bending my wrist this way with a little more ergonomic flexibility while still being able to change the angle of the tool so the chisel is the most effective on the tile being removed. And I wanted to leave access to the controls around this auxiliary handle. I didn't want any complications there. So I decided that this rotated hand grip position needed to be kind of out in this area here. I don't want it too far back because that, that's kind of an awkward position. I didn't want it so far forward that my knuckles hit and I didn't want it so cumbersome that I couldn't get to the trigger, the trigger lock switch and the variable speed control. And I also didn't want to compromise the tool itself by drilling holes in anything, by gluing stuff on here, or by notching or grinding any of the existing plastic housing on the tool. And I also wanted to maintain the AVS feature, the anti-vibration setup system, whatever that is, AVS. Uh, I wanted to maintain that. So I wanted the handle, the new auxiliary handle to a grip the existing handle and not the tool itself because of the isolation in the in the handle here and I should also mention that there's that vibration dampening effect in the in this handle as well so with those parameters I went into MacGyver mode uh, and got various pieces of pipe deciding what I was going to use for the handle so that in the end it would be a comfortable size for gripping for hours on end I gravitated towards plastic rather than metal or wood for the handle and I settled on this piece of one inch gray PVC pipe for electrical stuff because it's a good grip size. It's going to be really tough and durable. This must be schedule 40. It's nice and thick. And then I decided I wanted it oriented about here because that misses the trigger, etc. and these switches. Plus it's a good position low on the tool. I didn't want it down here, but I didn't want it up there either. So I kind of started out with an orientation like this and I wanted enough room between the tools handle and this handle so that I could hold on to this with gloves or whatever and not be jamming my hand in there. And I didn't want it too far back either because that just 
increases the leverage on the auxiliary tool and I'd have to make it stronger for no real gain on the function of the handle. So to have the handle positioned about here, I drilled some holes in some half inch Russian birch plywood and affixed a pipe back here for a handle that fits like this inside and outside the tools handle. And this ends up a real nice grip position. This could be positioned somewhere in this area. You know, different positions here would probably still be fine, but I chose to just make these two pieces line up to, to make the, making the handle itself easier. Obviously, this is the handle for, uh, for moving the tool. I put this piece in here so that it could pinch the existing handle here without cutting or drilling into the handle itself. And then this block underneath helps to support the handle this way so that it doesn't move around like that in use. Like I said, this is just a prototype. I just started working on it. I put dowels in here so I can screw it together. And I knew that this orientation was gonna work, but I needed to add something to this block to prevent this pivoting or tilting motion. And so I came up with this piece. It's just a piece of soft maple, with a couple of specially set up bolts, and that straddles the handle here. And as you'll see, this, these bolts will come in through the bottom to hold that in place. But while the handle is open like this, I'll show you this part, which is a U-bolt that I use here. And that pinches the handle to this piece of pipe to hold everything in place there. And I hope you can tell now why I wanted to do this in the shop, because this is hard enough to show as it is. And I'll show you one more piece of this setup right here, because I figured in time this piece of quarter inch rod that I bent and threaded is going to dig into the handle there. So I took another piece of uh, PVC pipe about that long. I cut it off and then slit that, then heated it with a heat gun. And while it was warm, I just fitted it to the handle here. And PVC pipe is very pliable when it's warm. So this was a great thing. You can see it kind of flares. The, the, the diameter, the radius here changes to contour to the handle. I didn't have to figure any of that out. I just warmed it up and pressed it on the handle there until it cooled. And now it's a perfect fit and a perfect shape to the handle. And this is a little bit awkward to show, but um, I want to keep that in place when I install that U-bolt. So I put a couple pieces of double stick carpet tape in here. And all that does is hold this in place while I'm assembling the handle. That carpet tape doesn't really do anything for the function of the handle other than just to hold this little piece of plastic into place. I hope you can see what that looks like. And now this U-bolt fits over here through two holes in this pipe. Just like that. And now I can slip this back over the plastic a little protector piece there and and on through that pipe to expose the threads on this part of the bolt. While I have the camera there, I'll start the nuts on here. And I used two nuts on this for jam nuts. If I were refining this prototype, I'd cut those studs shorter and then use a nylock nut on there, but I'm just going to do it like this for now. But that is one thing I would change if I was refining this prototype to a version 2.0. And it's difficult to start the nuts on there. This is a piece of just quarter inch rod that I bent and then used a, a die to run threads on the end of it. So if any engineers at Milwaukee are watching or listening, it would sure be nice to have this a snap-on feature of some sort. But as it is, I just use a ratcheting box wrench to run those nuts down and draw the U-bolt tight to the back of the handle and my little plastic protector piece. And with that U-bolt tightened up, you can see that that really is going to lock the handle into place there for front and back movement, but it still pivots on the end of the pipe in this other side. And acknowledging the fact that a tool like this is basically in self-destruct mode whenever you pull the trigger and beaten on tile or concrete like that because that kind of uh, work and effort is necessary to, to chip concrete and tile. So I needed to make sure this handle was equally robust so that it wasn't some flimsy piece of junk that 
I'd have to fuss around with all day every day and it would just slow down the work and extend the drama of chipping up the tile. So I needed to make sure that I got a secure fit between my auxiliary handle and the tool itself while at the same time being careful not to damage the tool if this didn't work or if it would avoid the warranty on it somehow. And to that end, I'll show you a close up of how these two side pieces work while gripping the handle. This part's gonna be a little bit tricky to show and explain, but the next step is to put the other side of this handle on here. And you can see that I have this half inch Russian birch uh, plywood. It's counterboard to fit the ends of this pipe. And it slips over the pipes like that. I made an arbitrary width measurement here just so my hand would fit comfortably between these two halves of the handle. And that um, space has worked out fine. But what that does is it leaves extra space between the auxiliary handles here and the body of the handle itself. So to take up that space and keep this from being a sloppy fit, I made a couple um, strips of maple here and stuck them together using Starbond CA glue to hold them in position. And then there's a little rib in the side of this block and that just helps it grip this side of the tool a little more firmly. And then the half inch blocks make up the space between this handle and that handle. I don't know if you can see it in this view, but there's another maple block down there. It's just a, a mirror image of this one. And this, the side of this handle also has a shallow rabbet in it for the end of this block, the handle support block, I'll call that. And then when this all goes together, everything kind of locks, interlocks, and pinches things in place with enough pressure to be sturdy, but not so much pressure as to damage. And with this orbiting shot, you get a pretty good idea of how this handle configuration works and how its relatively simple design is strong enough to operate the tool doing hard work for hours on end. And because I'm a carpenter first and a tool designer a distant third, I just used wood for all these components and there's just wooden dowels inside these pipes that allow screws to hold this half together. And then this is just a, a drilled block of maple for the bottom here. And with everything in place, I just use these number 14 screws to hold things in position. This is just going into the end of a dowel inside that plastic pipe. And FYI, those dowels are glued to the other half of the handle so that they don't just spin when I'm driving the screws into the round parts of this handle. And that right there gives you a real good idea of how this thing looks and acts. But there's one more kind of complicated part that makes this whole thing work because as it is, this handle can still pivot and would probably end up damaging this handle over time without this other part. And it's gonna be a little tricky to show as well but I'll zoom in so you can see what's involved with a better chance of the whole thing making sense. In similar fashion and reason, I want to use the idea of this clamp here to hold the handle to this part of the handle. I want to make sure that this part of the handle is secure with this part of the handle. And to do that, I came up with this piece of maple here and I cut in this contour with a bandsaw so that this contour matches the contour of the top of the handle here so that this fits nice and secure on that part of the handle. And again, this is really hard to see, but I just match the contour there. That sits right on there. There's no stress points or anything, and that'll hold it nice and secure without damaging this kind of soft rubber plastic here on the top of the tool's handle. And what I got going here is a quarter inch bolt that fits through this piece of wood. There's a stop nut and then an all thread coupler there so that I can have another bolt come in the bottom here, like so. And this is the bolt that needs to come up through the bottom of the tool. And I came up with one little conflict as I was putting this together in that this bolt hole and that bolt hole don't miss each other completely. And if I ever make a new handle, I'll just move this screw back a little bit so that this bolt clears. But for the meantime, I just run a drill bit through there to make sure there's adequate clearance for the bolt coming up from the bottom. So that now I can just slide the bolt up from the bottom. There's enough wiggle room in there to get it started in this bolt coming down from the top to draw that tight together. Admittedly, the tolerances here are a little bit finicky. 
And a redesign of the bracket I would easily work around this, but it's a little tricky to get this second bolt started. But with just a little bit of wiggling and diggling, I got the bolts and holes and nuts all lined up so that I can use that ratcheting box end wrench to snug everything up and secure this auxiliary handle. Another jam nut down here or some Loctite on these threads might be necessary for long-term sustained use of the handle. But this setup worked for everything I've used this for to date. And that segment probably tells you a whole lot more about this auxiliary handle than you really care to know. But it's very secure on the tool. You can see that it's operating that anti-vibration system. So that's still functional and should minimize ergonomic impact on my wrist even with this setup. Leaving me to just reinsert the bit and take this baby back to the job site and get to work. And you can probably hear your wrist thanking you already for sparing it the strain of hanging onto the handle this way. Man, that hurts. <laughs> so with that in-depth overview of the handle's design, features, function, and assembly, I'm actually going to take this back apart and do a little bit of cosmetic work with some paint so it looks a little more legit when I go back to the job site and show you this thing in action, chipping up that heavy layer of slate tile with its mortar bed from a 100-year-old concrete floor. I was so focused on showing you the auxiliary handle for this tool that I neglected to mention some important things about the video itself. So while Chip's over there taking the handle apart, I want to tell you that this video isn't sponsored by anyone, Milwaukee Tools or otherwise. I, I purchased that tool with my own funds for the job that I'm using it on. And even though I talked to my friends at Acme Tools about the project, this is not a tool that they gave to Next Level Carpentry for a review. And I wanted to keep it that way so that I can show how I use the tool and why I made the modification without worrying about stepping on toes from Milwaukee or anybody else because I felt that the auxiliary handle was a very necessary part of that being the right tool for the job. I shopped for other rotary impact hammers, SDS Max tools at acmetools.com, which is my source for stuff like this. And there's other brands out there, uh, Bosch and DeWalt, etc. But none of those other brands had the ergonomic handle like on this. So I basically chose the Milwaukee tool because of their reputation for robust tools and equipment, which is why I've chosen them for specific tools in my arsenal over the decades. And as it turns out, this tool was no exception. And because it's a piece of equipment I use on my day job, it's more important that I shop for value than price alone. And there's a wide range of prices for tools of this caliber and Milwaukee's price point for it allowed me to check the box for price off my list when making the decision for this particular tool. So if you're in the market for a heavy duty SDX Max, SDX Max rotary hammer or chipping hammer for this kind of work, I'd encourage you to check out Acme Tools because they have a wide range of tools of various brands, all different price points, plus everything that they sell is backed by a extensive product knowledge from the team there and you can contact them for particulars while you're making that sort of a decision. And not to put too fine of a point on it, I guess though, that my buddy Zach there at Acme Tools did send me this t-shirt a while back. And I enjoy sporting it for a video like this. But now that Chip's all done taking that apart, I'll make those few cosmetic improvements to the auxiliary handle and fire up the camera back on the job site to demonstrate how that machine works for the difficult job of busting up that old slate tile. Thanks, Chip. Yeah, for sure. I was glad to help out. But remember, I told you, I'm taking the next couple days off, right? So you're on your own when it comes to chipping up that tile. Oh yeah, I forgot about that vacation. Uh, how is it that you always seem to be taken off when there's demo work to be done? Oh well, glad for any help I can get. And good luck, take care. Well, all right, here I am back on site with the ergonomic handle upgrade for my Milwaukee rotary chisel. And either I've been here on the job site for a couple hours doing some nasty tear out, or I got the best hair and makeup crew on YouTube to make it look like I've been. But either way, I'm ready to put this Milwaukee machine through its paces 
So you can see how it performs chipping up a thick layer of slate tile and mortar bed. Because after all, that's what this whole review is about. But I'm not dreading the job as I would if I still had to hang on to the tool in this position instead of this more ergonomic position that I can do because of this handle upgrade. And you can see from this crouched down position what this handle looks like all painted up thanks to Chip. Got it looking smart, looking sassy here. It's almost Milwaukee red, not quite, but that's a branding issue, not a performance issue. When I started the video, I showed you a three inch chisel. That was my weapon of choice. And that's what I needed to use on the other floor because the material is really tough. But on this section, I'm going to try this tile chipping blade first to see if it's got enough of what it takes to get this tile up. Because anytime I can take things up in bigger pieces instead of smaller ones, I'm going to go for that. So I'll get this guy chucked up. And all these blades have a top and a bottom. I want the bevel to be down next to the floor. Try to adjust this position a little bit here. And there it is. That's about as close to horizontal as I can get. And you can kind of see what what this wrist action is like in this position. But with this handle, this is a piece of cake. It's very user friendly and it allows me to get a good position for the, both the tool and the chisel for tearing into this work. And I'm able to use this handle without a trigger on it because this has a trigger lock function. So I'm going to reposition the camera, but I'll fire up the tool and then lock the trigger in the on position like this. But I better plug it in first, right? And in these days of cordless tools, that's an easy faux pas to make. Not used to plugging things in, but I can fire the tool up and lock it in the on position with this function here. So I can run it hands free and proud. And there's a variable speed down here inside the handle. And I've got that at the setting that I want. And a small modification that'd be necessary for a version 2.0 handle would be a small hole here to access that variable speed wheel that's down inside. But as it is, this is set up at a good speed and I don't have to mess with that. But I do want to point it out as a minor shortcoming of this current handle configuration. And if you have the notion that setting up and shooting video on site is a simple thing, well, <laughs> I'm here to tell you you're mistaken. So bear with me as I shoot this segment without any kind of camera people around. And I don't actually know how this bit is going to work on this tile in this situation. So I'm just going to go into wing it mode and we'll figure it out together. And that's clearly not enough of foc uh, not enough focus power to get after this tile. So I'm going to reduce the width of the tip by 50%, which should at least double the impact power for separating this mortar bed from the concrete floor. And again, I'm using this with the bevel down so that the chipping force is Directed like this. That's a little better chisel position right there. So let's see if that's enough to make a difference. And I may have inadvertently adjusted the power setting, the speed setting down on the tool. So if this doesn't work, I'm going to have to get in there and turn that up. And that's not an untypical scenario. 
I'm just kind of working that edge, working it, working it. Uh, if you noticed here, that this stuff is actually set on uh, Dura Rock rather than on a mortar bed like I suspected. But that's all good. And even though these pieces aren't just flying up, the impact from the tool really makes a difference. And the alternative is sitting there with a two pound hammer and a chisel and beating on this for a while. But that Dura Rock is more flexible, uh, in a, so to speak, than um, a mortar bed would be. So I'm going to try to see if I can get a pry bar under here to take advantage of that little groove that I put in there with that tool. So I've just got a couple of small wrecking bars here and I've got a spud bar back at the shop that I wish I would have brought today. But in my the fence tile just like this that was laid in the hallway there was just mortar on concrete. So I didn't anticipate this condition here, although now that I'm looking at it, it makes perfect sense. So let me see if these pry bars are going to make a difference. Kind of obvious. I think I could darn near recycle these guys. And it looks like that Dura Rock was really well cemented to the concrete here, so I think that the rotary hammer is going to shine here more than it did on getting up the tile at itself. So let's see how fast I can scrape this well adhered Dura Rock off this concrete slab. I'll start by using the stock handle configuration so you can see how the awkward wrist angle is painful in a short period of time. It makes me anxious to switch to the ergo handle upgrade while chipping away at this layer of Dura Rock. And if you think the noise is obnoxious on camera, I'm here to tell you, you're getting the break. Because on site, this is pretty obnoxious, but also necessary. Well, I'd love to be showing you a video right now where these tiles just come flying off the floor because of the amazing chipping hammer. But hey, this is the way this stuff goes. You never quite know what you're going to get into. And sometimes your phone rings right in the middle of the work. And the reality of it is you just got to take it, take it as it comes. So I'm going to get this bit cleaned up here. Um, and I will tell you in another room where I have to chip up regular tile, I use that, uh, that wide tile bit and those tiles just popped off of there, which is a wonderful thing, but that's not the way it always works. So uh, I've got my Ginsu long handled pipe knife here. It's going to get this mess out of the way because that stuff is surprisingly strong. And there's two layers of it. Because that's basically what Dura Rock is. Mortar in between two layers of very strong fiberglass mesh. And now I'm going to kind of tackle this again to try to make a cavity under there before using these spud bars. And rest assured, when I'm doing this and there's no camera running, I got a dust mask on, etc. So I think I'll do one more row of tile here for the video and then do a wrap up before I tackle the rest of this with full PPE deployed. And I don't know if it's so obvious in the audio track on this video, but I can tell I'm making progress by the sound the tile makes when the chipping hammer is running. And I think that was enough progress there to attack it this way. Yes, and I was right. And I don't know if you can tell from the video, but I believe this dirt rock was set in a mortar bed and mechanically fastened. Because I think I'm hitting some tap cons in here. But either way, this chipping hammer or this rotary hammer with this ergonomic upgrade is making this removal process a whole heck of a lot easier than it would be otherwise. And for that, I'm thankful. I did reach in there to turn the speed up a little bit, see if that makes a difference. And I'm going to switch back to the wide chisel to see if it is strong enough for chipping up this Dura Rock. I kind of don't think it will be. But there's only one way to find out. Fire in the hole. 
Well, from that, I conclude that this is actually pretty good uh, for chipping up the that layer of thin set that's down there. But not so good for the dura rock itself. I think that the, the hammering effect is just spread out too far on that wide bit. But uh, a little more speed on the tool is helping. And let's see what that extra speed effect has on taking up the dura rock and that nylon mesh. I think it's pretty fair to say that this is about how this particular tile tear up project is going to go. Loosen the edge with the chisel, pop up the slate tiles with a pry bar, crumble the dura rock with a three inch blade, three inch chisel, cut the fiberglass screen with the Ginsu long handled cutoff knife, leather, rinse, repeat until the original concrete floor slab is clean and exposed and ready to accept the luxury vinyl tile plank flooring that's going to go down here as part of this deep dive facelift for a lower level family room. Well, I might as well wrap this up because that's about all I wanted to say and show in this review, modification and demonstration video. And if you like real world in the trenches video content like this, I hope you'll subscribe to Next Level Carpentry because there's a lot more where this came from. And if you find yourself heading into a nasty demolition project like this on a remodel or a facelift that you're doing and decide that you need equipment to get the job done that's a step above the standard DIY issue machinery, I encourage you to check out Milwaukee Tools and specifically Milwaukee Tools at Acme Tools. Because when I say I got to make it easy on myself because nobody's going to do it for me, that's not quite the whole story because Milwaukee and Acme really do help make things easier on me by making tough, nasty work a lot more doable and a bit more sustainable. So thanks for checking out the video. And before you click on to your next video, hit that thumbs up button so that this video gets a little more attention on YouTube and other viewers get a chance to see this review and modification and decide for themselves if this is something they need to do for making their life a little easier.